All right, so <laughs> this is, this is uh, um, the title of my sermon tonight. The title of my sermon is <clears throat> The Importance of Good Friends. And just, just following on, uh, I, I, I touched on it briefly last week when I talked about keeping God first in your relationships and thinking about the sort of friends you have. So I want to kind of just hone in on that topic and just really talk about the sort of friends you keep and the importance of good friends, right? Because it's not just about having friends, right? Because you can have good friends and you can have bad friends. So you, you don't want to just say, oh, it's important to have friends and then you just get yourself a bunch of bad friends, right? It's the importance of good friends, right? Because sometimes it's better to not have friends than have bad friends, right? Because bad friends have a really bad influence on you. Good friends will have a good influence on you. That's the difference, right? What's the difference between a, a good friend and a bad friend? Well, a good friend is going to encourage you and motivate you and, and help you to walk right, to walk with the Lord and to do what's right. Whereas what, a, what is a bad friend going to do? A bad friend is going to get you out of church away from reading your Bible, away from soul winning, wasting your time on vain things. So don't think bad friends are just friends that are going to make you fornicate and take drugs and, you know, you just think of, you know, really, really uh, sinful people. Bad friends are also just people that are working hard, just, just in the world with the cares of the world, and they take away from your spiritual energy. You know what I'm talking, you guys know what I'm talking about. Like, it's not just bad friends that have bad habits, but it's also friends that if you hang around too much, you start talking like them, acting like them, thinking more about the things of this world rather than the things of God. And that's why it's so important to surround yourself with good friends because friends can often be closer even than family and have an influence on you. You know, look at what the Bible says here in Proverbs 18. We'll just start here. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So I always like to just remind people that S-H-E-W is pronounced show, right? It's just an old uh, spelling of the word show to, to, to demonstrate something, right? Must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So it's not all friends. I mean, all friends can stick closer than a brother, but that's why it's dangerous to have bad friends. Right? Because bad friends can be closer than family members and have more of an influence sometimes than family members. And it's saying here, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Now that's good if you have a good friend, not so good if you have a bad friend. So we're going to look at just three uh, scripture passages of examples of good friends. And then we'll look at a few passages of bad friends. And then we'll talk about the influence that friends can have. And then we'll finish off with just a few tips on making friends how to make friends so first of all good friends so when i think in the bible of the perfect example of two guys that were really good friends in the bible if you know your bible as well you'd think of david and jonathan right king david this was before david was his when saul was king so jonathan was king saul's son and if you remember, David was the one that was going to become king after Saul because Saul had disobeyed the Lord in offering sacrifice. Or he didn't kill all the things that God had told him to kill when he told him to go and basically take out a land. So the kingdom was taken from Saul and given to David. David was the son of Jesse, if you remember. But, you know, when, I, when you read through the story, you don't really know why. I mean, I, I haven't figured, maybe you guys know, I, when I read through the story, I don't know why they became such good friends, but the story kind of starts in 1 Samuel 18. So 1 Samuel 17 is when David goes against Goliath, right? And then 1 Samuel 18, it says here, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, so this is when um, David was with Saul, uh, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul so this is what friends do right they love each other so much the bible says that they stick even closer than brothers do and this is like why again it's so important that we have good friends now if you i'm just i'm just highlighting a few verses in the relationship between david and jonathan but here in first samuel 20 is when david uh and jonathan realize uh that saul might be out to kill david Right, because Saul realized that David's going to take the throne after him, and Saul's starting to get jealous, and you know the evil spirit, and all these sort of things. So Jonathan is trying to figure out if Saul, his father, is actually going to kill David. 
So he goes to this dinner, and I don't know if you know the story, I'm just brushing through it. But he goes to this dinner, he finds out that his dad is actually going to kill David. And leading up to this passage, what he does is he says, he says with David beforehand, he says, when I find out from my dad whether or not he's actually out to kill you, you know, you go and hide, you know, in the, in the bushes, and then I'm going to come out with, with my archery, with my, with my bow and arrow, I'm going to have three arrows, and then I'm going to try and shoot at the mark, but I'm going to purposely miss and shoot the three arrows. And then when my lad goes to go collect the arrows, if I say to the lad, the, the arrows are beyond you, then you'll know that my dad wants to kill you and you should flee, right? But then he says, but if I say to the lad, the arrows are actually, you know, before you, then it's safe to come back. So he, he says that, he, so he shoots his arrows and then, and, then he, and then he says to the lad, you know, they're beyond you, right? Because his dad wants to kill him. But David, rather than fleeing, actually comes out to say goodbye to Jonathan. And this is where we come here in 1 Samuel 20, verse 41. And as soon as the lad was gone, so this is the lad that Jonathan is saying, oh, the arrows are beyond you. David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept one with another until David exceeded. So you see here the friendship between them was so strong. And, you know, why are they so sad? We, we don't really relate to Jonathan and David these days. I mean, maybe we live in a culture that's not so intimate, you know, between, between males, right? Now, some cultures, like, people kiss and they're more intimate and, and things like that. I know in Asian culture, there's like no intimacy at all. So I, I struggle to get over that barrier. So you guys, you guys got to show me some love, right? So I can get, get that, get that, uh, I got I to gotta get my holy kiss going, right? But uh, here, I think we don't relate because we, I, I sort of think like, why are these guys so sad? But then you think, oh, it's because these guys don't have Facebook. These guys don't have telephones. You know, like when, when he's saying, you know, you've got to flee. My dad's trying to kill you. He doesn't know when he's going to see David again. Right, and then they, they meet again sometimes in battles and stuff like that. Uh, it reminds me of when I, and this is nothing like this, but you know, it reminds me of when I went to Mexico, and we just kind of when we went there, I'm just thinking like, am I ever going to come back to Australia again, or am I, you know, destined to live in Mexico the rest of my life if, if Elizabeth's visa didn't get granted? And then when we came back, it's like you get down on your knees, you kiss the ground, and you're like, ah, oh, so thankful to be back in Australia. But here, you know, this is why they're so sad. They don't know why, when they're going to see each other again. And let's jump to 2 Samuel 1, when David finds out, and this is jumping even further. Now, uh, David is king. You know, Saul has been, has been killed in battle. Same with uh, Saul's son, Jonathan. And David finds out in 2 Samuel 1 that Saul has been killed. So that's how, this is how you can kind of remember. If you're not that familiar with your Bible, you know, 1 Samuel is basically the story of Saul. 2 Samuel is the story of David. And then when you get into 1 Kings, you start getting into the prophets, you know, Elijah, Elisha, and things like that. So that's how I sort of remember what's happening in each of the books. So when you get to 2 Samuel 1, you've just gone from the story in the last chapter of 1 Samuel that Saul has just died in battle, right, with Jonathan, his son. So now somebody comes to David to tell him of this news. And this is David lamenting over the death of Jonathan and Saul. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle, O Jonathan? Thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Now that, that's an interesting phrase that he actually acknowledged. And I don't know whether maybe he didn't have that good a relationship with his wives, right? Maybe because he had, he had multiple wives. Maybe they thought differently of their wives in terms of mates. But he's saying here he, that his friend was so dear to him. He says that the love that he had with his mate, right, was more than the love that he had with women, right? And I think some guys can relate. You know, when they, it's, it's nothing, and it's nothing, you know, obviously people try and pervert the Bible and make this a sexual thing, but no, this is just two guys ha re having really close friendship. And often we, we would call that like bromance, wouldn't we? Right? <laughs> two, two bros are just so close, you know, maybe, maybe people that go to war can relate when they just fight together and they're comrades and they've watched each other's back and it's a different sort of love. Right, um, but here he's saying that that love that was even greater than the love he's experienced with a woman. Now, some some women might be envious of this. You know, some women are envious of bromance, 
And I think it's not something to be envious about, ladies. It's just, you just have to realize that men and women are different. And it's just like men. Men shouldn't be envious of, of relationships that women have with their girlfriends, right? Because it's just, we feel a different need, right? So women may relate to women a bit differently, and men relate to men differently. And often you, you have a different type of relationship that you have with your wife as you do with your mates, right? Your, your mates that are of the same gender. So here we see that. We see this close relationship. And I don't think it's something to be envious about. I think, and, and I think if you uh, don't acknowledge the differences between man and women, you may have some strife in your relationship. And it, there doesn't need to be. You, know, you just need to acknowledge, hey, things are just different, and, and that's just how it is. You know, pe people have friends, are friends differently. Now, ideally, <clears throat> in an ideal world, your, uh, your spouse will also be a very good friend. Right? So this is my second example here in Song of Solomon 5. So yes, there is physical intimacy between you and your spouse, right? but ideally, it, not, it shouldn't just be that. You, know, you shouldn't just think of your spouse as just somebody you go to bed with, or your spouse as somebody that just provides a paycheck for you to buy what you want, or you know, you know, that just fulfills your physical desires, or you know, cooks you dinner, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we shouldn't think of each other. We should also think of our spouse and strive to be friends as well. In Song of Solomon, we see here, we see uh, uh, here where I guess Solomon is writing from his, his wife's point of view, I would say, because Solomon is writing Song of Solomon. And the woman in Song of Solomon 5 is describing, uh, obviously, the physical intimacy with her husband. She says, my beloved is <coughs> white and ruddy. So ruddy, as I understand it, is another word. I, I remember looking it up. It just means like, beautiful as well. Uh, is white and ruddy. And I, I used to think that ruddy meant like dirty. You know, because when you hear the word ruddy, it's kind of like, like, like cruddy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I used to think it meant like dirty and things like that. So when, when it described David as ruddy, I'm like, oh, maybe he's kind of like a brawly guy. But then I realized it meant that David looked beautiful because ruddy actually means beautiful. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm 99% sure. I remember looking it up one day. Uh, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. Now people often joke when they read through Song of Solomon that obviously like a, like a Hebrew person, you know, describes somebody different to how we would describe them today. I, we wouldn't describe a woman as having like a neck like the tower of something. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices. As sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, dropping sweet smelling myrrh. So we see here as you read through Song of Solomon, if you haven't read through Song of Solomon before, you see here the description of the relationship between a man and his wife, and it's a beautiful thing. And I think that's where the Catholic Church goes wrong, because the Catholic Church kind of has like tabooed all sex, right? You know, they're priests are celibate, you know, um, you have bishops in the Orthodox Church that are celibate. And, and Catholics are often raised with the mentality that sex is a, is a wrong, inherently wrong thing. And they often think of Adam and Eve eating of the forbidden fruit. That forbidden fruit was actually an analogy for them sleeping with one another and somehow taboo, which is not true at all. Because remember, they were sleeping with one another before sin, right? They, 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 they knew each other before sin. This was part of God's perfect plan, right? His perfect world. So, so the relationship between a husband and wife is a beautiful thing. And this is what we see in Song of Solomon. So the, what a husband and wife do is, is a beautiful thing. It's when it's outside of marriage, it becomes a dirty and sinful thing. His hands are as, uh, as, are as gold rings set with the beryl. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. Look at this. This is my beloved here, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So you see here, the ideal scenario is that, yeah, you are attracted to one another. You, you serve one another, but you're also good friends as well. So that's what you should strive for in your relationship. The last example I have of good friends is John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist, when he talks about himself as being the friend of the bridegroom, referring to Jesus Christ. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. 
But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Look at this. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So he's obviously talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here and him being the prophet that comes before the Lord, uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ. But the principle or the lesson I want you to take from this is that when you're a good friend, a friend is thinking about the happiness of his friend, right? Sometimes people are friends, but they, they, they have a friend for themselves. And we're going, to think, we're going to look at those examples next. But here we see, especially, he says, my joy therefore is fulfilled. Why? Because he rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So you see how he's happy because his friend is happy. And that's what a good friend is like. A good friend, it, it doesn't just make friends to serve themselves, but they're happy when their friend is happy. And if you have friends like that, and you're a friend like that, then you'll be a good friend as well as have good friends as well, if your friends are like that. So I think of, you know, it's like a friend who's not trying to steal the show. And sometimes that happens amongst ladies. I, I, I don't know whether it really happens amongst guys. Maybe in this sort of feminized <laughs> society that we live in, it happens with guys at weddings too, where like a groomsman might try and like steal the show from the, from the, gro uh, from the groom. But uh, you've probably seen that happen at weddings with ladies, right? Where one of the bridesmaids might want to try and steal the show from the bride and, and sort of get more attention than the bride on her day. And, and that is not a good friend. A good friend will want the bride to be the centerpiece on her day, you know, just as John the Baptist is saying here about Jesus Christ. He must increase, but I must decrease. So that's three examples of good friends. Let's look at three examples of bad friends. And like I said, we're talking about the importance of having good friends, not just having friends. Because you can have friends that are bad friends. And the first example we're going to go to is Jesus Christ himself. Because Jesus Christ had a friend that was bad. And we know who he was. So we'll look at that in Matthew 26, verse 47 here. It says, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. So we see here that, you know, bad friends are ones that stick around but end up stabbing you in the back in, in a time of need or betraying you or turning you over to, to the authorities. Uh, verse 49, And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. So it's an interesting thing here. I mean, you know, obviously there's the friend because they were companions, but, you know, a lot of people would, would believe that Jesus actually loved Judas. You know, like Judas made that choice, even though Ju Jesus knew the choice Judas was going to make. You know, I believe that Jesus did love him, you know, and he, and he, and he wanted to, to, him not to make that choice, but I guess him being God, knowing that he was going to make that choice, and he already had a, a plan for him. So he says to him, friend, wherefore art thou come? And this is actually a, a prophetical as well, because we see in Psalm 41 a prophecy of Jesus being betrayed by his friend. He says, yea, he are, yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So there's one example of a bad friend, you know, one that betrays you. Another example is with Samson. Now, I won't go too in-depth into the story of Samson, but, you know, Samson obviously hung around the wrong people, got in over his head gambling with the Philistines. And what's interesting here is he marries a woman, and then, uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly the story, but somehow he gets away from this woman, and then in Judges 14, verse 20, it makes this statement here that's it's interesting, and we sort of talked about it as well uh, when I talked about good friends. It says here, but Samson's wife was given to his companion, look at this, whom he had used as his friend. So that's where you don't have a good friend either. Where you have a bad way, you have friends that are just your friends because you fulfill some need for them, right? You're fun to hang around, that's why you're, you're, they're your friend. And now that you're not fun to hang around, they're not your friend anymore. That's when you know they're not a good friend. And here, Samson had friends that he did like that. He used them as his friends. He hung around them because he got something from them, right? To use as his friend. And we have some Proverbs of this sort of behavior. In Proverbs 19, verse 6, 
many will entreat the favor of the prince. What is it saying here? It's saying a lot of people are nice to the prince. Why? And every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. See, that's why often people, they, they strive to be rich. They strive to have a lot of possessions. And then they start to realize they don't know who their true friends are anymore. You know, people that win lottery, all of a sudden, all the friends come out of the woodwork, right? The friends, all right? This is why we have to be careful. We need to, need to know the difference between good friends and bad friends because bad friends just use you as a friend. And you, and see, we can talk about like other people as well, but you, you need, remember when I preached about having a mind of service, you need to apply this to you. Right, you need to think, I don't want to be this sort of friend. You know, am I just friends with somebody because they fulfill something for me or I get something from them as opposed to the other way around? Proverbs 28. Uh, this is talking about, you know, just uh, the, the trouble that Samson got into. I just wanted to show you this principle that, um, that applies to him. Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. So that's another reason why it's important to have good friends and the influence that they'll have on you. Samson is a good example of him hanging around the wrong friends. He used people as his friends. He had the wrong company. And if you know the end of Samson, he ended up losing his eyes, you know, losing his you know, strength. He ended up, you know, he was used by God one last time when he committed suicide, but he did not end his life on a high note. Now, the last example I want to go through, um, and, I know, and the reason why I just want to go through these examples, because a lot of these examples are really interesting stories, but in 2 Samuel 13, this, this I believe, to me, is just one of the saddest stories in the Old Testament. I don't know if you're familiar with this story of um, uh, <clears throat> Absalom. Uh, Absalom is one of David's sons, and um, basically... Uh, his sister Tamar in this story was, is raped by Amnon, the son of David, another son of David. So David obviously had multiple wives and I don't, I don't think Amnon and Absalom were brothers of the same wife, so, but they were both sons of David. So Absalom had a, uh, had a sister called Tamar and she was very beautiful. And Amnon, which was a brother, uh, I guess a half-brother of Absalom, really desired Tamar. So the reason why I want to show you the story, because the reason why he got into this scenario was because of the bad advice of a friend. So let's read from 2 Samuel 13, and I'll just read the story with you. If you're not familiar with the story, it's, it's, a, it's a really sad story. And, and really, um, you know, I mean, you can learn a lot of things from it, especially, you know, men getting yourself in the wrong situation uh, with, a, with a woman and being in the wrong you know, situation alone. Um, and, and, and men just doing the wrong things, um, just fulfilling their, their lusts. So 2 Samuel 13, uh, chapter one, uh, verse 1, says here, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister, whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So basically, Amnon's got a crush on Tamar. That's how we would say it these days. He's got a crush on Tamar. He's just like so vexed, you know, because he just desires her so much that, you know, he, he doesn't actually think about doing anything. You know, that's, that's what he's saying here. But verse 3 is where the trouble starts, right? It says, but Amnon had a friend. And this is one thing I'm trying to hone in on this sermon is the importance of having good friends. Because here, Amnon had a bad friend. That gave him bad advice. It says, But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. So subtle means very, uh, you know, deceitful, cheeky kind of thing. And he said unto him, Why art thou being the king's son, lean from day to day? He's saying, Hey, if you're a king's son, why do you look so bad, basically? Well, wilt thou not tell me? Tell me why you're looking so sad. And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, so here's the bad advice. Lay thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. So what is he saying? He's, saying basic, he's, he's basically saying, fake it that you're sick 
and ask King David to send Tamar to come and look after you. And why is Jonadab saying that? It's so that they can have some alone time together, right? But it's a bad way of doing it because it's nighttime, they're alone, that sort of thing. It wasn't the right way to go about it. Verse 6, So Amnon lay down and made himself sick, and when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat at her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Amnon takes the advice of Jonadab, pretends to be sick, asks his father, Hey, can you send Tamar to come look after me? And then he sends Tamar, and she goes, because Tamar was an obedient daughter. Verse 8, so Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house and he was laid down and she took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. So it's not like back in those days, you just, you know, on the way down to Amnon's house, you just passes by coals, right? And picks up a loaf of bread. I mean, to go look after him, she's actually, you know, going, doing some work. So, you know, it gives you a sort of idea of the character of these ladies when they go to take, take care of somebody. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. Right, why? Because he's probably thinking about what he's going to do, right? And Amnon said, have out all men from me. And they went out every man from him. So he's saying, everyone, out of the room, right? So all the servants go out. It's just him and Tamar now. And Amnon said unto Tamar, bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come, lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. So what is she saying there? Like, don't do this silly thing, right? And the reason why he's in this scenario is because he took the advice of Jonadab, right? And what she's saying here, she's saying, you're going to be seen as a fool in Israel. And, he's, and she's saying, if you just ask King David, he'll give me to you as, as, as your wife. And you don't need to fornicate, basically, against her will and rape her. Howbeit, he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. And this is where it just, oh, it just blows my mind. It's so sad. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise and be gone. Wow, like, doesn't that just blow your mind? And, and, and this is why I think people don't realize that, you know, there's, there's more to a successful relationship than just physical intimacy. You know, that's why Am Amnon just thought, you know, he just wanted to fulfill his desire. But it's probably because, you know, he raped Amnon, he, he raped Tamar. She probably wasn't enjoying it. And, you know, that, then it's just, it's not enjoyable for either of them, right? So he's just a fool doing it. And why did he even get himself in this situation? Because he listened to bad advice from his friend. And she said unto him, there is no cause this evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. And she had a garment of diverse colours upon her. For with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. So she's wearing a a garment of a very colorful garment and that symbolizes that she was a king's daughter and a virgin and tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of diverse colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying so it's just such a sad story there you know because why because amnon you know, obviously i'm not taking the responsibility away from amnon but why did he come up with it because he, he had a friend that gave him bad advice. That's why it's so important to have good friends because good friends will not only be there for you in good and bad times, they'll encourage you to do what's right. They also won't necessarily give you bad advice. You know, sometimes you have friends that are of the world, they're non-believers or they're not in church and they give you bad advice. You know, this is what's happened here. And if you know the rest of the story, um, 
it, it doesn't end well for Absalom because basically because because David didn't really do anything about Tamar being raped, <coughs> Absalom was really bitter, which was Tamar's brother, right? And that's where he sort of goes off the rails and um, Tamar goes to stay with Absalom and sort of downhill from there for him. So anyways, interesting story. So Proverbs 13, just a, a, a principle there that sort of applies to this story. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So again, important why we have good friends and why really it's because of the influence they have. Right? That's why it's so important to have good friends, godly friends, because it's the influence they're going to have on your life. 1 Corinthians 15, on that same token of you know, having, giving bad advice, having a bad influence, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, be not deceived. Right? This is really important that you're not deceived, you're not, you're not uh, like ignorant about the influence that friends have on you, right? Because you've got, you got to realize if you're not influencing your friends to live for God, they're probably influencing you, right? Don't kid yourself. You know, I've been there as well. You know, you start off with good intentions, right? Hey, you know, I'm like the shining beacon of light amongst my friends. And then you get amongst that crowd, the flesh, you get in the flesh, and that light of yours that you thought was so bright just starts getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, you know, and you gotta, you gotta pay attention to this because if you don't, you're just gonna go back into your old ways and you're gonna be less effective for God. You're gonna be overcome with guilt. You know, you might, hopefully you don't go into that, you know, that roller coaster ride of Christianity, which is like, oh, God can't do anything with me and you get out of church and then hopefully you get out of that ditch, right? doesn't mean you lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation, but you'll just be ineffective for God. So you don't want to be deceived by this. Evil communications corrupt good manners, right? And, and don't think you're stronger than, you know, the rest of us, right? Because, you know, we've all been there. We've all tried to be that shining beacon of light amongst a group of friends that are ungodly and they drag you back, right? So you need to be very aware of this so that you need to make sure if you're not influencing your friends they will have an influence on you and what do i talk about when i talk about influence i'm talking about the way you speak right the way you speak what you joke about the type of music that you listen to right what about bad habits you know people try and stop drinking stop smoking but they're still hanging around friends that are drinking and smoking and you're gonna you're not gonna be able to stop drinking and smoking if you have friends that drink and smoke right so you got to think about if you want to make these changes in your life sometimes you need to spend less time with them i'm not saying you necessarily need to just cut them off but it's just the amount of time you spend with them you know oftentimes when, when we i remember when i was in uni you had more time i mean you're hanging with your friends every day right when you're not married you know, you get home from work, hey, what are you doing, buddy? Yeah, I'll come over. I remember I had friends like that in Perth, just hanging out with them all the time. And then when I started wanting to live for God, I started realizing, you know what, I got to spend less time with my high school friends and I just start spending more time with my friends at church. So I started to make that switch. Now when I made the call to say, hey, what are you doing? I'd start calling people from church, you know, calling the guys from youth group and saying, hey, what are you guys doing tonight? Oh, yeah, we're going to a cafe. I'm going to come hang out with you guys and we'd be talking about hey what's on at youth group you know what what evangelism events are happening at church and it, it changed it totally changed how how much easier it was to live for god just because of the people i surrounded myself with it's the same with materialism some people have a lot of friends at work and you know you hang around a lot of people at work what what, what do they talk about their career aspirations you know what do they want to do at work how they're trying to get the next promotion you start thinking, about it. they're talking about they're building this house, they're building that house, they're going on this holiday, and you start thinking, oh man, like, I want to do that too, right? So you don't really necessarily want those friends. You want the sort of friends that are trying to talk about, hey, what are we going to do for God next? What's the next project? Hey, you're going soul winning next week. Hey, let's get more involved at church. You hang around those sort of friends. That's the sort of influence you want. So you need to recognize this, and it's not necessarily cutting them off completely. It's just spending less time from influence of bad friends and getting more influence of good friends in your life. You want to replace some of those, that time with godly friends. So that's one influence that they can have. Obviously, they can corrupt your good manners when you hang around with bad friends. Um, another good influence of good friends, uh, Proverbs 27 verse 6 here, it says, 
Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So one thing that's good about having good friends is that they give you honest feedback, right? Good friends will tell you the truth, right? They will tell you, well, they'll be honest. Now I'll say faithful are the wounds of a friend because just because some, that good friend, a good friend giving you advice doesn't always mean that it's good advice, right? Because ultimately good advice is based on the scriptures, right? They're giving you godly advice. So you still need to always test any advice that they give you. But sometimes you need to hear it from somebody in order to take it on board. So it's good that they give you honest feedback. It doesn't mean it's always right, but they, they do have sometimes good intentions. So you need to be aware. If you do have good, sometimes you have good friends in the, in the world, right? meaning unbelieving friends, that really do care about you. you know, it's not that unbelievers are just completely, you know, can't, you know, can't do things good to somebody else. But you need to be aware. They don't always give you good advice. And one area that I definitely would warn you about is unbelieving friends or Christian friends that don't know their Bibles giving you advice about your marriage, right? That is one area where I think is very dangerous where, you know, you have like a friend that's out there and they're like, yeah, you know, you, you shouldn't just do whatever he says and just, you know, basically just telling you to disobey God, you know, and, 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 and just getting you away from what God wants from a woman um, and wants from a man. So keep that in mind. Right? So it doesn't mean advice is always right, but at least it's faithful. You have good, if you surround yourself with good friends, then you don't just surround yourself with a bunch of yes men. Right? And I don't want to be surrounded by a bunch of yes men. And I'm glad I'm not surrounded by a bunch of yes men. Because you know, sometimes when you're, a, when you're a bishop in a church and, and you, know, you, you don't surround yourself with people that can be honest with you, then you, know, you can do no wrong. Right? If you just surround yourself with yes men, I want people to be able to tell me things I'm doing wrong. I can reflect on that. I can try and change as a person as well. I want my wife to be able to correct me as well. Right? So it's the same with you men. You know, your wife should be able to correct you. Don't get offensive too easily. Because if you do uh, defensive too easily, then she may not tell you the next time. Right? So you want to keep that uh, line of communication open. Proverbs 27:17. Bible says here, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So we see here that it requires love to be able to correct one another as friends because it's abrasive, isn't it? Because when iron sharpens iron, they're going to rub each other sometimes the wrong way. But you need to be able to do that so that you can sharpen one another and grow together. And we see here that iron is sharpening iron. So it's not that one person's always doing the correcting. It goes both ways, right? So if you have a good friendship, correction and instruction and advice goes both ways. And that, that, that should be like that in church. You know, I don't mind if people give me advice or people correct me on things and tell me I'm wrong because I can take it too, you know? Like I may have more life experience than some people. I may know the Bible more, but that doesn't mean I'm perfect, right? So it's the same um, even between you guys and me. So it requires love, it requires giving and receiving correction. And the last one I have just on this influence, and then we'll just quickly talk about some things about making friends, <clears throat> is it says here in Proverbs 27, 9, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. So I'll just read that one to you because I already sort of talked about that. You need to be surrounded by good godly friends so that when you get advice, you get good, godly advice. So just a couple of things on making friends. Um, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you, I mean, I hope you guys don't struggle with this. I don't know if, I, if some of these things just come more naturally to others because others are just more naturally outgoing, you know, more naturally, uh, you know, talkative and, uh, and, and find it easier to make friends. But we all need to grow in this area, you know, because we all need to be People, pers people persons, right, as Christians, because we need to live in a world with other people. We need to love each other as a church. We need to get to know each other. So we need to grow in this area because some people will say, hey, you know, well, I'm not a very outgoing person or I'm not a very extroverted person. I kind of just keep to myself. And I think that that's fine if people are naturally like that, but we shouldn't strive to stay that way. If you're a naturally introverted person, you don't really put yourself out there. You don't really let your guard down. You don't really go and talk to other people. This is where you have to grow as a Christian. 
because this is one way you can serve other people, right? You have to serve people this way by making friends because making friends is not just about having friends and people being friendly to you. Like you think, hey, well, I don't have any friends because nobody's friendly to me. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says here, and we started with this passage, but we sort of focused on the second part of this verse. But Proverbs 18, 24 says, a man that hath friends, look at this, must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So you see what the Bible's teaching here is if you want friends, then you need to be friendly, right? You need, it's, it's about making friends, it's about being a friend. And when you be a friend, this is how you make friends, right? So when you think about being a friend and, and, and showing yourself friendly, I always think about, <clears throat> you know, maybe like greeting people. Yeah, and, and it's, so, it's so tempting. I mean, even at work, like, I, I try and like break my habit of this because you know, sometimes at work, you'll be like, you know, you'll walk next across people or you'll be standing in a lift with somebody else and you just kind of think, I'm just going to ignore them because I'll probably never see them again. So you, know, you just sort of get out on your floor. Do you guys do the same thing? Am I the only one that does this? I'm sure I am. Because you know, you get into a lift and you, you kind of like see each other, but you just kind of like, well, they're not going to say hello to me. I'm not going to say hello to them. Like, what's the difference? We don't really work together or anything. Sometimes it's like that in church too. Now, it's, now I don't really experience that because I pastor this church. So I, I kind of get to it. I know everyone. I, I kind of like the glue sometimes that holds everyone together. But it shouldn't be like that. You know, it's like, it's like the body. The body is not all joined at one point, right? The body has joints and bands and it's joined at different points. This is what a church should be like too. That's why there should be relationships all over the church, like a healthy body does. Not just like every, you know, like I've got my arms sticking out here, my legs sticking out, everything's connected to the head, right? It shouldn't, shouldn't be like that. That's not how a body works. So a church is the same. So when I think about greeting, you know, people say things like, well, nobody says hello to me, as opposed to thinking, well, do you say hello to people? When you come to church, do you think, hey, I'm going to go say hello to that person. That, that person just looked at me and didn't say anything. Why don't I just go say hello to them? Because they're probably thinking the same thing. Like They looked at me like I didn't say hello to them. Because that's what it's like in the lift. Can you guys relate to this or not? Are you getting some blank face? You know when you're in a lift, you're both probably thinking, like, oh, I could say hello to each, to each other, but, I can't. but if somebody, I don't want to be the stupid one. That... So to, to remedy that for myself, I just started saying hello to everyone at work now. It's like when I walk past somebody, I'm just like, hey, how you doing? And then, and then it's not so weird when I put myself out there to say hello. So I'm trying to get myself into the habit of just saying hello to people. I stop and they're like, oh, hey, how you doing? You know, my name's Victor. And they sit next to me, hey, hello. Just, just saying hello, just acknowledging that, the, that they're there. And then it's not so weird anymore. I, I, anyway, that's how it works in my mind. Because before it was kind of weird because it's like, when do I start doing it? So then I just force myself to start doing it. And now I'm just like, to say hello to anyone. So I'm trying to do that a bit at work. Um, it's the same with hospitality. You just got to start somewhere as well. Like, you know, just, just, you know, if you're thinking, hey, I want to build some relationships in church, just pick somebody and just go, hey, I'm going to invite that person over for dinner. You know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ask, you know, whatever, you know. I think inviting people over for dinner works fine. I've got to do more of that, admittedly. I used to do it a lot more before. But at least once Elizabeth recovers, we're going to start having more people over for dinner, right? But I want you guys to do the same. You know, you guys have, have each other over for dinner too. Don't be shy. If, if you don't know a family in church, then just reach out to them and just say, hey, like, hey, do we want to come over for dinner sometime? We just get to know each other. Um, gifts as well. So let's go on to another one. Proverbs 17, a friend loveth at all times and a brother is born for adversity. So this is about being a friend. You know, so being a friend, it says loveth at all times. When you're a good friend, your friendship is not always at stake when things go wrong, right? If you think about your good friends, you go through up times and down times, but when you have good friends, you're not thinking, oh, just because I'm going through a down time or we had an argument, we're no longer friends anymore, right? So you want to be that sort of friend too. Just because you have a bit of a conflict with somebody or a bit of tension or a disagreement, that doesn't mean you're not friends, right? That just means, it doesn't mean you don't love the person anymore. It just means you disagree on something. So same here, friend loveth at all times and a brother is born for adversity. So especially when somebody's going through hard times, this is where friends look out for one another. So it's when they're having a bad day or they're going through hard times. <coughs> uh, let's go on to the next one. So I just got two more and then we'll finish. So Exodus 33, I just took this one from, uh, from Exodus 33, 11. It says here, when the Lord spake unto Moses, Face to face, look at this, as a man speaketh, 
unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. I just think it's interesting here that, you know, if we're going to learn from anybody, we could learn from the Lord himself. And the, and the Lord himself is saying here, hey, a good friend has some face time, you know, and not... That's Simon the Wild on there. Has some face time with their friends, right? So you're not really a good friend when you never see face to face somebody this is why church is so important this is why church is on every week so that you have an opportunity here to come and make friends and see people face to face right and that's why it's good to have people over to see people you know to go soul winning with people to serve together because the more face time you have with people the easier it is to make friends as well like if you come to church you just stay for the preaching and you never talk when you leave you're not really having much face to face time with people and that's why you're probably not making as many friends too but you know, obviously there's more to making friends than just seeing each other on Sunday. It's about being involved in each other's lives, serving together, you know, take, making the effort to go and talk to other people. And this is really the, 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 one of the main reasons of church. Yes, we get together to learn, but we also get together as an opportunity to meet each other and to talk to one another over dinner. The last one I wanted to talk to you about here is in Proverbs 18, and I'll just finish on this point. Uh, Proverbs 18, uh, I know it's not entirely related, but I, I think of this when, when it comes to making friends. Proverbs 18, verse 19, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Now, obviously this is talking about when you upset somebody or you offend somebody, their guard goes up, right? And it's really hard to break back into that guard if you offend somebody. But what I want to sort of take from this passage is when it comes to making friends, everybody has a guard, you know what I mean? Like your defenses. And it's, it's you really not being open with people. I mean, if you think about this, it's like they, they're, they're sort of being cold towards somebody if you've offended them and you can't sort of win back their graces. And this is saying, obviously, it's warning us to, to not so easily offend people because it's hard to win them back once you've offended them. But at the same token, if you want more friends, you need to be able to let that guard down. Like if you want to be able to make a friend back with that person who's upset you, if you just keep the guard up, then you'll never be friends again, right? So there's where you get offended, but there's also just making the friend to begin with. A lot of the reason I find that people don't make friends is they're just not willing to open themselves up, right? It, it, you think about like just in a relationship, like if guys aren't willing to put themselves out there to be hurt, by the girl and be rejected, then you'll never find a wife. Now, to a lesser degree, friendship is the same, right? If you're not willing to put yourself out there, if you're not willing to, you know, like to, to say hello and somebody not really be interested to in getting to know you, you know, you feel silly, but you had to take that risk to make the friend because if, because they may not take, but if you take the risk, then you make a friend, right? So this is why like at, at work, I do have some people that I'm quite friendly with because you know, I'm quite open and I'm honest with them and then that, help, that allows them to be open and honest with me. So everyone has a guard and my advice to you is if you want to make friends and you want to help people lower that guard, you have to lower your guard first, right? So if you lower your guard, you open up, you need to put yourself out there a bit. You need to risk being hurt. You need to risk being offended, risk being embarrassed. And if you're willing to take that risk, then you get the return of making a good friend because that's sometimes what it takes to make a good friend, right? So girls have it a bit easier when it comes to relationships because guys are kind of expected to, to do that. But when it comes to making friends, maybe that's why women struggle more to make friends, right? My wife and I talk about it all the time. Like men don't struggle so much to make friends. Maybe they're used to just letting the guard, out, guard down and just like being made to look the fool. But women, not so much. And then when women try and make friends with each other, their guard is still up, right? So the question is, among, even amongst the ladies, like who's going to let their guard down first, right? Who's going to let their guard down first to risk being hurt to make a friend? But I definitely encourage you to do it, you know, especially amongst your Christian brothers and sisters. You know, you need to be, you need to risk being hurt, put yourself out there if, you're, if you want to make friends. So if you show yourself friendly, you open up, then people are more likely to open up with you. And that's how a relationship is built. Anyway, let's pray. 
Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you for your word. Uh, there's just so much, so much advice about friendship, about marriage, children, um, living the Christian life. Lord, we just need to read your word and just search the scriptures daily and we will be able to see the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ. So thank you, Lord, for giving us your word. I pray that this sermon has encouraged people to, to make uh, good friends and the importance, Lord, of having good friends in their life and the influence that they have. Help us not to be deceived. You know, evil communications corrupt good manners. So, Lord, I pray that as we continue to grow, we will consider all aspects of our life. And, uh, Lord, help us to surround ourselves with godly people and help us to be a godly influence on somebody else's life. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.